Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to, ev uh, to everyone. Barriere Koe Bari Galus Bolorin. Welcome to Professor Barak Medina, Director of the Hebrew University, the Very Reverend Father Aran Gokchian, Mr. Tzolag Mumjian, esteemed lecturers, esteemed musicians and singers, honored guests, honored guests from the Hebrew University, the Armenian community of Jerusalem and elsewhere. Welcome also to all of you who have arrived physically here for the first event to be held at the Mandel Building since the start of the pandemic, and welcome also to all those who are joining us uh, via Zoom. I have the pri privilege to open this evening in remembrance of the genocide of the Armenian people in the Ottoman Empire, which reached its crescendo in 1915. We have come together to honor the memory of the victims of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, to remember the survivors, to venerate those who resisted and to show our appreciation and respect for all who have worked over the generations to bring about the resurrection and flourishing of Armenian communities and cultures around the world. We are proud, yet humble at the same time, to hold this annual commemorative here at Mount Scopus campus of the Hebrew University. This is a long-standing tradition, temporarily upended last year due to the pandemic. We can be proud that the call for recognition of the Armenian genocide has for many years been sounded here at the Hebrew University. And as the years have gone by, ever higher officials in the university administration have joined us in this effort. This year, as in our previous event two years ago, the rector of the university has come to convey his greetings and we thank Professor Barak Medina for being here. On the other hand, we are humbled in that we will realize that whatever we can do or say here is only a pale echo to the suffering and heroism of the Armenians over a hundred years ago. At the same time, Jews have both a right and an obligation to commemorate this event. The experience of the Jewish people in the 20th century was such that we have a special and unique understanding of the modern history of, of the Armenians, and we have a responsibility to raise this matter, especially in Jewish communities around the world and in Israel. It is a shame and embarrassment that in this name of Realpolitik, none of our governments have we ever unequivocally recognized the Armenian genocide and called on the government of Turkey to take responsibility for the actions of its Ottoman predecessors. This is all the more shameful in light of the recent formal recognition by the President of the United States, uh, Joe Biden. We are still under the heavy impression of the tragic events in Artsakh in the, in the fall and the unnecessary loss of lives. We send our condolences to the family who lost dear ones and speedy recovery to the many injured. We will hear later this evening from Naamar Ringel about Israel's highly problematic role in this conflict. This year's commemoration marks the publication of the book Israel's Failed Response to the Armenian Genocide by Israel Charney, just now published by Academic Studies Press. The great significance of this volume made it worthy of special mention in, the ev in this evening, and we are very pleased that the author is with, uh, with us now. We certainly look forward to hearing from him and as well as the other lecturers. So without further ado, let, let us start our program. I will leave the many thanks uh, for my final words. Let us be begin with the customary but important greetings. I would like to call upon Professor Barak Medina, Rector of the Hebrew University, to convey his greetings. Thank you, Yakir. <clears throat> Dear uh, friends, uh, distinguished guests, Thanks for uh, coming here and being with us. Uh, we gather here today to remember the genocide of more than a million Armenian men and women. These are people uh, who were massacred because of their religion and ethnicity out of hatred. As in other instances of such atrocities, the massacre is not an isolated event. It is the culmination of many years of incitement against, against an ethnic minority, discrimination and denial of rights. And uh, it is our duty today to fight against all forms of, of discrimination and incitement against minorities and to strive to, uh, for equality and respect of human dignity. We at the Hebrew University view it as our duty to take part in the events of remembrance of the genocide of the Armenian people. And I'm uh, grateful uh, to Professor Stone for initiating uh, this long and important tradition. As an institution that is located in Jerusalem, 
and belongs to all residents of Jerusalem, our hearts and thoughts are with the dear Armenian Jerusalemite community. I understand from my friend Harut Baramyan that most members of the Armenian community in Israel are dissidents and survivors and refugees, are dissidents of survivors and refugees of the genocide. And this community is part of us. Uh, denial of past atrocities adds to their suffering, and we should try to correct this injustice and to contribute our small share by remembrance and by showing solidarity. In addition, mainly given the Israeli government's policy of denial that we will hear more about today, it is our moral commitment as a university to remember, not only based on academic interest, but in order to prevent future atrocities, <clears throat> events of remembrance such as this may bring about sense of recognition and possibly one day <clears throat> even uh, to uh, obtaining reparations and other forms of transitional justice. Again, I'm grateful uh, to uh, all the organizers uh, of this important event and to all of you that uh, came uh, to be with us in this important event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Barak Medina. Over the years, we have maintained warm relations with the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem and always coordinate these memorial events with them. This is time to send our warm greetings to His Beatitude Archbishop Nohan Manugian, Armenian Patriarch of Jerusalem, who has been very supportive of this annual event. This evening, Father Aran Gogchian will convey greetings from His Beatitude. Please. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming and honoring the Armenian nation and all the Armenian martyrs. <clears throat> Honored Director of Hebrew University, Professor Barak Medina, Professor Ruven Amitai, Chairperson of the Library Authority of the Hebrew University, Professor Israel Charney, Psychologist and Genocide Scholar at the Hebrew University, Professor Michael Stone, Emeritus Professor of Armenian Studies, Dr. Odette Steinberg, Scholar at Hebrew University, ladies and gentlemen. For many years, the Hebrew University has the tradition to commemorate the Armenian Genocide with a special memorial evening and symposium. All these years, the Armenian Patriarchate has received an invitation to join the commemoration which is characteristic of good relation between us and this university for which I would like to express my appreciation. Joint efforts of Hebrew University scholars have been doing even more, namely also advocating the recognition of the Armenian genocide by the Israeli Knesset, as well as publishing sharp critique on defamatory articles in the Israeli press. It is deplorable that even now, in the 106 years after the genocide, the Israeli government still refuses to recognize the Armenian genocide. In the outset of the Second World War, nefarious Turks systematically and in a premeditated manner massacred Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, slaughtering men, women, and children, deporting them from their historical homes, forcing them to walk to the Syrian desert on the so-called death marshes. Most Armenians did not even reach there, as they died en route from exhaustion, lack of food and water, brutally butchered by the Ottomans. That did, did not arrive in the desert, awaited the same fate as the others. Not many Armenians escaped the systematic killings by the Turks. On those that did, some found refuge in the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The Armenian refugees found shelter in the compound of St. James and were absorbed in the Armenian community whose presence dates back to at least the fourth century. The Armenian church has recently sanctified the genocide martyrs 
so that we do not look only to their death, but see beyond the grave and live by their faith. It is our duty as descendants of genocide survivors to commemorate the victims as well as to not forget the heinous crimes who massacred them. However, it is likewise our duty to carry on our legacy bequeathed to us through the centuries. For us, that is the continuation of our tasks at the Armenian Patriarchate and the Holy Places. Scientific research in Armenology and the commemorative evening and symposium like this form an integral part of this. Honored Director, Professors, thank you very much for your efforts in bringing us together on this commemorative evening. Thank you. Thank you, Father Gogchian. For many years, Mr. Tzola Gimomjian, Honorary Consul of the Republic of Armenia in Jerusalem, has been a steadfast supporter of our program in Armenian studies and this annual memorial of the evening. Mr. Momjian supports us with not only, not only with sound advice and facilitating, connect, and facilitating connections um, to the Armenian community and the, and the Republic of Armenia, but also generous in providing fiscal assistance for this uh, year's event. I'm happy to invite him to convey uh, his greetings. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be back at the Hebrew University. Under the eyes of many from all over the world, Armenians and non-Armenians, who are watching us now on Zoom. America is back. Diplomacy is back, said President Biden in his speech on the 4th of February. President Joe Biden on Saturday became the first U.S. president to officially recognize the massacres of the Armenians under the Ottoman Empire as genocide. In a statement marking the 106th anniversary of the massacre's start, Biden wrote, each year on this day, we remember the lives of all those who died in the Ottoman era, Armenian genocide, and commit ourselves to preventing such an atrocity from ever again occurring signaling a commitment to global human rights. Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu said on Twitter, I quote, we have nothing to learn from anybody on our own past. Cavusoglu is not denying that their past is part of them today and they are proud of it. Dr. Pam Siner, the great-granddaughter of Henry Morgenthau, on April 22, 2018, here at the Hebrew University, gave a speech about the Armenian Genocide, Morgenthau's witness, Israel's silence. She said that, and I quote, for me, this event is the culmination of nearly three years of varied negotiations over the publication in Hebrew of the important book by Henry Morgenthau, my remarkable great-grandfather. In spite of Israel's firm position not to recognize the Armenian genocide, Israeli scholars, Knesset members, journalists, activists and many of the general public have recognized publicly the Armenian genocide. This negative stance 
of the Israeli governments against recognizing, uh, recognizing the Armenian genocide is counterintuitive to normative and liberal democratic considerations, including the specific historical experience of the Jewish people. Historians and scholars have concluded their work that indeed it was a genocide. Now politicians must have the courage to make justice to the Armenian people, this small tribe of unimportant people whose wars have all been fought and lost, whose structures have crumbled, Literature is unread, music is unheard, and prayers are no more answers. I was quoting William Saroyan, who was an Armenian-American novelist, playwright, and short story writer. All this said, I have to go back 25 years ago, Professor Michael Stone, Professor Emeritus of Armenian Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem called me and thus, and thus started the commemoration day of the Armenian genocide at the Hebrew University. Today the torch is carried forward by Professor Ruven Amitai, chairperson, library authority of the Hebrew University, professor of Islamic history, the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies and the Institute of Asian and African Studies and the Program of Armenian Studies. I would also like to thank Professor Asher Cohen, the President of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I would like to thank also Professor Barak Medina, Rector of the Hebrew University, Professor Israel Charney, the great scholar of genocide, who was awarded Armenia's presidential prize, is with us this evening. He is the encyclopedia of genocide. I would also like to thank all the speakers of this evening and all the crowd who is with us and others who are listening to us. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Mr. Momjian. I would like to invite now Mr. Haut Baramian, co-chair of the Union of the Armenian Communities in Israel, and previously an MA student in the Faculty of Law at the Hebrew University, to deliver his greetings. Please, Haut. <clears throat> Honorable Professor Medina, your Excellency Mr. Momjan, Reverend Father Aran, dear Professor Charney, Professor Amitai, Professor Stone, distinguished guests, good evening. On behalf of the Union of Armenian Communities in Israel, I greet you all as we are gathered here this evening in this distinguished institution to pay tribute to the memory of 1.5 million victims of the Armenian Genocide the first genocide of the 20th century, and one of the most gruesome unpunished crimes against humanity. I was probably 12 or 13 years old when, as a part of school project, and for the first time I heard the story of my paternal grandparents, who witnessed the destruction of their families and homes, and were forced to march to the deserts of Syria only to end up in an orphanage in Jerusalem. Surprisingly, only two days ago, when I was writing the opening remarks of the Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day commemorative evening, that my mother started talking about her father, Garabed, born in 1899 in Kesab, today in Syria. She didn't say much about him. She only mentioned that he was a very kind and optimistic man who sometimes used to sing some folk songs in Turkish, depicting the horrors he experienced during the days of deportation. She said he used to cry. She said 
they used to comfort him, the family. My grandfather, whom I never met, was a living testimonial of the Armenian genocide. Such stories of his and others like him are part of our collective memory that shape our national identity today. On Saturday, I recited one of many such songs written and sung by the survivors in his honor and in memory of all those who perished and in respect to all the fortunate men, women, and children who endured the genocide. Therefore, as a grandchild of genocide survivors, I have always felt an obligation to remember and remind others about this crime, which was not only committed, committed against the Armenian people, but it was committed against mankind as a whole. Therefore, the recognition of this crime is a moral obligation and the prerogative of every individual, institution, or state that fight and struggle for historical justice and human rights. Since impunity encourages more crimes, and since Turkey not only denies the fact that it organized and perpetrated a genocide, but together with Azerbaijan continues to threaten the existence of the Armenian people, today it is more important than before to recognize and condemn the Armenian genocide. It is important to learn and teach about the Armenian genocide and other genocides. As an NGO and an organization in Israel, whose one of its main goals is to preserve the rich Armenian history and culture in this country and advocate issues that are of concern to the Armenian people, we highly appreciate the efforts of the organizers of this important event and for all of you for attending here tonight. Professor Amitai and Yoav, special thanks. Shnora Galuchun. Aizem, a few words in Armenian. Actually, it's from a poem. Aizem askini manchar, bartken astvads uashkar. Hadutsumu yegerni, yer pellini, hai jogovurta, tartial bidiharni. Harkank mir piravorna hadagats. Thank you all. Thank you, Harut. Now let us turn to the program itself. As is our, is our tradition, we will start with the reading of Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14, the vision of the dry bones, which we present in the original Hebrew and then in the Armenian translation. Mr. Hagop Janazian will read it in Hebrew. Then Mr. Yoav Luf, our long-time teacher of Armenian history and culture, will read the translation into Armenian. Please. יחזקאל פרק ל"ז הייתה עלי יד אדוני ויוציאני ברוח אדוני והניחני בתוך הבקעה והיא מלאה עצמות ואעבירני עליהם סביב סביב והנה רבות מאוד על פני הבקעה והנה יבשות מאוד ויאמר אלי בן אדם התחיינה העצמות האלה ואומר אלוהי אדוני אלוהי מתי ידעת ויאמר אלי הנבא על העצמות האלה ואמרת אליהם העצמות היבשות שמעו דבר אדוני כה אמר אדוני אלוהים לעצמות האלה, הנה אני מביא בכם רוח וחייתם, ונתתי עליכם גידים והעליתי עליכם בשר, וקרמתי עליכם אור, ונתתי בכם רוח וחייתם, וידעתם כי אני אדוני, ואני באתי כאשר ציוויתי, ויהי קול כי ינבא, והנה רעש, ותקרבו עצמות עצם אל עצמו. וראיתי והנה עליהם גידים, ובשר עלה, ואקרם עליהם אור מלמעלה, ורוח אין בהם. ואמר אלי נבא אל הרוח, הנבא בן אדם ואמרת אל הרוח, כה אמר אדוני אלוהים, מארבע רוחות באי הרוח, ופחה בהרוגים האלה ויחיו. והנבאתי כאשר ציווני, ותבוא בהם הרוח ויחיו, ויעמדו על רגליהם חיל גדול מאוד מאוד. ויאמר אלי בן אדם, העצמות האלה, כל בית ישראל המה, הנה האומרים יבשו עצמותינו, ואבדה תקוותנו, נגזרנו לנו. לכן, הנבא ואמרת אליהם, כה אמר אדוני אלוהים, הנה אני פותח את קברותיכם, והעליתי אתכם מקברותיכם, עמי, והבאתי אתכם אל אדמת ישראל, וידעתם כי אני אדוני, בפתחי את קברותיכם, ובעלותי אתכם מקברותיכם, עמי. 
ונתתי רוח בכם וחייתם והנחתי אתכם על, אדמ... על אדמתכם וידעתם כי אני אדוני דיברתי ועשיתי נאום אדוני. תודה רבה. יב ירב עברה עם זרנט ירן יב יהנזיס הוגבוינט ירן יב ידזיס אימץ' דשתין יב עין לי אל וסקרו כמו דקן יב שרז'צויץ זיס סוז' שוז' אז וסקרו כן יב אהה בזום הויז'אין עברה ירסץ דשתין יב צמקיאל כויז' יב אסצ'יס ואותי מרדו יצא תקן דנילי ניצין ווסקלקד אדוקיק יבשם תר תר תו גיטס זית יבשציס ואותי מרדו מרגריאץ עברה ווסקלצד אדוציק יבשסס צדוסה ווסקלק צמקיאלק לוברוק אספתגה מסטיארן אייספס עשה תר תר צוסקרוסד צדוסיק אהבסיק יס עציץ עברה זר שוג' קנטני יבטץ עצז ג'ילס יבעציץ עברה זר מרמינס יבצגציץ עברה זר מוט יבטץ זוגי עם עצז יבלינצ'י קנטני יבצניצ'יק תה יס ים תר יבמרגריאד צא ורפס יב הרמן יד אינסטר יב ירב בר פר עם ארגניאלן עימום יב אהה שרז'ומן יב מרדצב ווסקר אר ווסקר אר יורא קנצ'ור הודס יב תסי יב אהה צ'ילק יב מרמינק פטאין יב צגר עברה נוצה מוט יב שונש ווטש גויר אי נוסה יב אסציס מרגריאץ ואותי מרדו מרגריאץ עברה שינשוין יבא סצס צשונצ'ן, אייסבס עשה תר תר, יק שונצ' אי צ'וריץ הורמוץ, יב פשיה אי מריאלס, אייסוסיק, יב קצן, יב מרגריאצה ורפס יב הרמניאד אינסטר, יב ימות אי נוסה שונצ'ן, יב ירן קנדני, יב קנדצן קצין אי ורא ותיץ יוריאנץ ז'רובות בזום הויש הויש יב חוסצב אנד יס איס תר יב עשה ואותי מרדו ווסקלקד אייטוקיק אמנין טונת ישראליה יב דוקא אסן צ'ורצן ווסקלקמר הדב הויסמר יב מרק ואסן אייטוקיק מרגריאץ יב אסצס צדוסה אייסבס עשה תר תר, אהבתיק יס בציץ אס גר זמן אס זר, יב הניץ אס זז אי גר זמנת זרוץ ז'רובותים, יב טרייץ אס זז הרקרינד ישראלי, יב זניצ'יק יתה יס ים תר, אי בנל אינץ אס גר זמן אס זר, יב הנל אס זז אי גר זמנת זרוץ ז'רובותים, יב תת זוגי אם איצז יב לניצ'יק קנטני יב ידיץ אסצז הרקרין זרום יב זניצ'יק תה יס ים תר יב חוסצה יב אראריץ עשה תר תר Thank you very much. Now we'll have our first uh, musical interlude. First we'll have a poem um, Uh, Dante Agan, read by Asmig uh, Arababian from Haifa. This will be then followed by uh, three songs. The first will be Adana, sung by Marie uh, uh, Chachadurian, followed by uh, Krung, Crane, sung by Ovanes uh, Kumarian, a seminarian of the Brotherhood of St. James in Jerusalem. Both will be accompanied on piano by Kevok Badalian. And then we'll have Yer, uh, Yerkra Sharj, Earthquake, performed on piano by Eric uh, Borosian. So please. U 
Ure i rastvats. Jer pa virume in čak mi voh čjogovurt. Lure i rastvats. Artarucian ačkere pak vec. Šurteri nas gis. Agotke sarec. Turke, hai ajunic, zerke de hanum, asar tunki, meče labanum. Udagardume, jerkin, matagnac, jesen dari, srtim piti poragrem, vorpes verker, jerku milion, hai anum nes. Vorbes het keren hajot verki, vorbes mech keren hova gandi, vor mort vecin, jataganov, kar mart kucianach ki arač, togac neranc diak nere, anabat nerum, a ja harač. Je vlusine, der zarurik, Mer pat mučan mahaganik, magagat im jedine curt, vor ein krvi hohmeren angut, pokel, netelen minči jedking, a in čeren aj schagach, meller neri glhovan cel, a in ču, viša pakach, co vic mi burenk mna cel. U vosochy srdým pítí, je zde porem, porem, porem. Ič pes vyhere na radatý, jerku milion, hajanu než. Ach, der pítí porem, porem. Vor čana čví, kotorac nere hajoc, žechtví. Ես պիտի փորեմ, փորեմ, շնորակալություն, տոդարաբա։
Thank you very much for these uh, lovely performances. We now get to the academic section of this evening. We will have uh, three lectures. Our first lecturer is Professor Israel Charney of the Hebrew University, who is a psychologist and genocide scholar. He is the editor of two volume Encyclopedia of the Genocide, and executive, executive director of the Institute of the Holocaust and Genocide in Jerusalem. He's also the author of the recent book, Israel's Failed Response to the Armenian Genocide. His lecture will be on the crisis of conscience, Israel's policy to Armenia. Please, Professor. Parev, shalom, hello. But I'd like to begin with a note of condolences and shame. The condolences over the great number of deaths in the Gorno Karabakh. I was interviewed by the editor of a Boston Armenian American paper and I refer to the deaths of 2,000, which is an enormous number that we in Israel remember well from one of our wars. And she corrected me, there were 5,000 who died in that tiny, tiny, tiny area and country. And the shame and the anger that accompany my condolences are about the contribution of Israel of the weapons, and as we know, tragically, in particular, the drones that are reported to have made a huge difference in the impact of the Azeri attack and the other weapons. Now, I'm also going to take a quick moment to recognize an individual death of a very great Armenian American professor who died this week, Vartan Gregorian. I am astounded at the man's vita. He was the president of the New York Public Library. He moved from there to the University of Pennsylvania where he was the rector or president? Provost. Provost. Provost, thank you. And from there, he moved to Brown University, where he was the president. And from there, he moved to the Carnegie Foundation, which he headed until his death. I met him for the first time at the New York Public Library. We had a 20-minute meeting where we worked and discussed the basic meanings, processes in the denials of genocide. It was one of the most exciting intellectual and spiritual experiences I ever had. And then years later, we had the privilege of having considerable support of the Carnegie Foundation for our work at the Jerusalem Institute on the Holocaust and Genocide, which I have had the privilege of leading these many years. But my next theme is not condolences, it's Mazal Tov, that's in Armenian, over the recognition of the Armenian genocide, Sof Sof, finally by the United States of America. And we all know the country that has to be next. I'm honored and pleased for tonight, also representing the presentation of my new book, Israel's Failed Response to the Armenian Genocide and listen to the subtitle, Denial, State Deception, Truth Versus Politicization of History. And I'll take a moment to recognize briefly a few people 
The first being Professor Yair Aron, who unfortunately is not with us tonight because he is not feeling well, but is one of the great pioneers of genocide studies in Israel and an enormous contributor to the understanding of Israel's policy in denial and escape from the truth of the Armenian genocide. And then I would like to recognize Mr. Mark Sherman, Master of Library Science. And Mark, your book is waiting here. Uh, who, in our many years of working together, now comes as the person who contributes a chapter to the book on the history of our institute in Jerusalem that to me is great reading and full of information about this once non-existent field. There were no genocide studies when we started. It was not a recognized subject in academia anywhere. And I'd like to recognize a very dear lady by the name of Karen Wahlberger. Karen, would you stand please? who is the managing editor of this work. <laughs> that applause is for you also, Mark. I should have asked you to stand. Uh, and it's been my great pleasure to work with her for these many years. A note of appreciation to you, Professor Michael Stone, Michael, to you, Professor Ruven Amitai, for now, for every time, for all of the work that you're doing. Michael, for you as the pioneer of so much of Armenian studies in Israel. The book begins and presents at some length a whodunit. For those of you who are not Americans, that means a detective story. Who is out to destroy the first international conference on the Holocaust and genocide in Tel Aviv in 1982? This was quite a conference. It was the first one that we know of, the first academic conference in the world on genocide. This was the first use that we know of, of the linkage between Holocaust and genocide. And think of that linkage for a moment. When we began to use it, and then went on to create the institute in that name, there was a great deal of opposition from two sources. There were those who said, how dare you speak of other genocides besides the Holocaust? And there were those of our colleagues who said, why do you still bother to talk about the Holocaust when you're trying to study genocide? And you understand the meaning, the answer that we represent. The conference also turned out to be inadvertently a classic case study of standing up for academic freedom. It's been recognized and written about extensively, for example, by Terence Dupre in the Yale University magazine. We had a real job on our hands. The, a scholar recently published an article in a proper journal of Balkan and Near Eastern studies and wrote as follows. The first appearance of the Armenian genocide in Israel, domestic, political, and foreign policy was in the notable 1982 Holocaust and Genocide Conference. The Armenian genocide was genocide in every possible respect, politically, religiously. Listen to this jihad in July 1915. 
portion of it. God will punish them in your hand and put them to shame and you will overcome them. Your enemies are trembling under your hand. Attack them from every side. Whenever you meet them, kill them. Jihad, jihad, O Muslims, blow the trumpet everywhere of people of the unity. The great God is ordering you to fight with your foes everywhere. God will put them to shame in your hands. And goes on to promise the uh, beautiful nymphs of the Muslim paradise as a reward for the magnificent act of killing human life. Let's compare for a moment the Holocaust and the Amer Armenian genocide. The Holocaust was an enormous tragedy, enormous act of evil to a given object people. And the Holocaust, by implication, conveys the horrible message the truth that all mankind, any and all human beings of every possible national, racial, religious construction are potentially victims of these activities of fellow human beings. Did I say anything that does not apply entirely fully to the Armenian genocide as well? Are they not of the same fundamental cloth? You may join me in being amazed that when I came to this country in 1973, I found there had been published an article in Hebrew in the magazine of our religiously oriented university, Bar Ilan, by Professor Pinchas Lapid. And it was called in Hebrew, in Hebrew HaShoah HaArmenit. And I said Shoah because that's what Professor Lapid called the Armenian genocide. HaShoah HaArmenit Kechazara Klalit LaShoah the Armenian Genocide as a dress rehearsal for the Holocaust. Had we recognized, we, civilization, the meanings of the Armenian Genocide more fully, not only out of caring and respect for the Armenian people, but as a message to humanity, we would have been in a far better position to attempt to prevent the Holocaust and many disasters of genocide since then. Incidentally, for those of you who don't know, the Armenian genocide featured German military people who were killers and consultants on killing. And any number of them who were now specialists, fully accredited, went on to serve major roles in the Holocaust, for example, in the Einsatzgruppen, because they knew how to do away with masses of people. In the Jewish tradition, it is an ethical imperative to recognize and to help other people who need help and are in distress. When you read the book, you will find, among other things, a rather intimate view of the story of Elie Wiesel and the conference. You'll also find a gallery of actual correspondence with Elie Wiesel. He's a dramatic example of the up, down, in, out, of absolutely caring. And there were any number of actions on his part on behalf of recognizing the Armenian genocide, but at the same time, he pulled back, withdrew, and fought against us. My relationship with Elie Wiesel with regard to the conference began with my inviting him to be the president. He wrote back charmingly, I accept, 
I'm in need of mitzvot these days. I'm in need of good deeds, the word in Hebrew. But then it goes on to the point where Ellie resigns as president because of the pressures of the Israeli government to close the conference down. I have one letter from him in our tumultuous relationship where he writes me, we were on a first name basis, of course, but this letter is, dear Dr. Jarney, do not use my name ever again. And at the same time, six months later, we had renegotiated meeting again. I came to his apartment in New York City. He opened the door and luxuriously embraced me and we embraced one another. And as things went on, there was talk at one point, I'm sorry it never took place, of a conference on genocide to take place in Hiroshima. And I was asked to play a role in that. And I invited Elie Wiesel to be active there. The man who had said that he has trouble with recognizing other genocides. And he agreed. But then, a few months later, the Encyclopedia of Genocide was ready to be published, the encyclopedia that Solak Mamjian recognized earlier, and Eli had agreed to write the introduction. And as a matter of fact, the Library of Congress entry, professor librarian, <laughs> already showed introduction by Elie Wiesel. The machinery was well in motion. And we sent him the final proofs, because we're ready to publish. And then he announced that he's not going to write the foreword. He refused to tell me why. I think I know why. I think he opened the encyclopedia and he found in it that we relate to the genocides of a great many peoples. Incidentally, I'm proud to say that our encyclopedia was the first that we know of that gave a meaningful, quite considerable treatment to the Armenian genocide, which had been excluded from one encyclopedia after another, Britannica and so forth. Are you trying to signal me about a time limit? Okay, I'll keep my genocidal speech short. <laughs> the, the book goes on to detail how the government of Israel attempted to stop the conference. They began by telling me that the six lectures out of 300 that were scheduled on the Armenian genocide had to be canceled. When I made it very clear that we would do no such thing, they upped the ante and told me that the Armenian academicians who had been invited to the conference should not be allowed to participate. When we rejected that, firmly, they said, you need to postpone the conference and we'll pay for the conference taking place in another country. Among other things, it soon became clear that you can count on the government paying for a conference. Um, I don't have to finish the sentence. No, but the truth is the whole thing stank deeply. They attacked my position at I was then teaching at Tel Aviv University. They went after our financial resources. We had one check for $10,000 that we deposited for the conference. They went after the donor organization, which was a Holocaust survivors organization, and got them to cancel the check. They called registrants from our preliminary program all over the world and told them in the name of the State of Israel, we ask you not to attend. 
they called people who arrived in Israel for the conference and told them that the conference was canceled. The other day I had a message from a lady, a very fine genocide scholar in Germany, who has written a review of the new book that will soon be published. And she wrote me that she was speaking with the head of a human rights organization in Germany who said to her, don't you remember? We registered for the conference and we were ready to go. But then we received a call from the Israeli embassy in Germany telling us that the conference had been canceled. And on and on it went. On the opening day, we had three different main speakers who had agreed to give the initial keynote presentation, who at the last moment succumbed to the government instructions to stay away. And I recall with deep respect that the situation was saved by a lady, some of you will remember, who later became Secretary of Welfare in the government, Ohan Amiel, who came and gave a wonderful presentation. And then I devoted the second part of the opening evening, which was at the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv, to a conversation with the audience telling them everything that had happened. I'm aware of the time pressure. I want to go on to say that writing the book about the conference led me inevitably to the question of where is Israel with regard not only to the Armenian genocide, but with regard to the genocides of other peoples. And the record is appalling. The issue is enormous. For example, a few months ago, a member of Knesset proposed a bill to recognize the ongoing genocide against the Yazidi people by ISIS. And it was voted down with government pressure. What has Israel said about the Uyghurs in China? What has Israel said about the Rohingya in Myanmar? What does Israel say about the Kurds persecuted by Turkey? What does Israel say about the killing of Christians in a variety of countries all over the world, Nigeria, Egypt? Moreover, oh, I should have said, I couldn't resist, and a major chapter later in the book is about Israel's orientation to the genocides of other peoples. And that led to the further issue of Israel's sales of arms to countries that are actively engaging in genocide at that time, let alone to countries where there is an anticipation of danger, such as in the case of Azerbaijan, where Israel continues to sell arms to such countries without any policy whatsoever discriminating as to the human rights, the, human, the lack of human rights of a given country. Gantz spoke out against this a few weeks ago. In other words, this is not an issue that intelligent people are unaware of. And yet it is not an issue before the Israeli people. And what I'm going to want to say in conclusion in a couple of minutes is that I think the time has come for a concerted year-round movement, not just a meeting once a year at the Hebrew University, God bless, to pressure our Israeli government to battle for recognition of the Armenian genocide specifically, to battle for recognition of the genocides of all peoples and to speak out the way we say, where was the world during the Holocaust, for us to move away from being like those countries who did not respond to our Holocaust, to battle the government style of censorship 
to battle the government style of fake news. I can tell you story after story. Armin Wegner was a German tourist reporter. And many of you will remember or know him as the person who inadvertently was in Armenia when the genocide erupted and took critical photographs of the events secretly, of course. And then the same Armin Wegner, when the events of the Holocaust are beginning to unfold, and a beautiful expression of the naivete that I love in decent people, wrote Mr. Adolf Hitler a letter explaining and calling for an end to the indignities that, indignities that were beginning to be practiced against the Jews. Mr. Wegner was properly rewarded with a long stay in a concentration camp as a result, and with all the consequences thereof. With regard to my basic message tonight, that it's time for us to fight more and harder and more wisely and more consistently for values in Israel, I want to quote Armin Wegner in conclusion. Whoever speaks the truth, he writes, says an Armenian proverb, has to have always at his disposal a saddled horse. So I'm going to mount my horse now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chani. I, for one, am looking forward to reading the book, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here. Our next speaker is Dr. Oded Steinberg. Oded is a lecturer at the Hebrew University at the European Forum and the Department of International Studies. He works mainly on the theme of historical migration among Anglo-German 19th century scholars. His talk this evening is titled, Our Armenian Brothers, James Bryce's Philo-Armenian Network, 1876, to 1894. Oded, please. Thank you. Uh, dear honorary guests, in this very short lecture, I will delve into the earlier pre-genocide period of the 1870s and 1880s in order to briefly trace the long-term engagements of Britain with Armenian suffering. I argue that this rather understudied period is mainly crucial for researching the origins of Armenian suffering. Furthermore, this subject mainly sheds light on the question of how or did or if did Britain transform its Armenian policy from the Eastern question of the 1870s through the Hamidian massacres of 1894-97 and finally with the genocide of 1915. Throughout the 19th century, there was a certain British interest in fate of, uh, in fate of the Christian livings under Ottoman's, Ottoman rule. And here I refer, of course, to the Greece 1820s and Lebanon 1861 especially. However, it was mainly from the 1870s following the full eruption of the Eastern Question in the Balkans, Batak, of course, 1876, and the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, that the condition of the Christians, including the Armenians, emerged as a more central humanitarian and political concern for the British sphere. In response, good. In response to their continuous anguish, many British individuals and organizations mobilized resources and operated in certain proto humanitarian networks that acted on behalf of the uh, Armenian communities. For them, the Armenians were the bulwark of Christianity and in desperate and existential need of Christian aid. 
As part of this Christian aid, there were even growing voices that expressed the urgent need to embark on a crusade against the great port. The Armenian hands were occasionally imagined as part of a greater Christiandom that must be rescued from the hands of hostile Islamic regime. Here, of course, you can see one of the Punch magazine caricatures from the area, from the era, sorry. One clarification, I named these Armenian aid groups as proto-humanitarians since unlike the humanitarian groups of the second half of the 20th century, which mainly act through, uh, I would say, formal agencies in order to aid every human being with no specific religious or national prioritization, the proto-humanitarian activities were primarily non-formal activities that were based on religious or national kinship. And it's a, a muscular figuration that we must make. Now, one such central humanitarian network which operated during this period was the Bryce Network. It was named after the politician, historian, and jurist James Bryce, who functioned as the network's core. Bryce was engaged with the Armenian question for almost 50 years, from the 1870s and until his death in 1923. Thus, Bryce, due to his very long Armenian engagement, is a critical figure in studying the transformation of the British response towards Armenian sufferings. Now, following his tour of historical Armenia, <laughs> Bryce became enchanted by the Armenian land, people, culture, and history. It was in the same tour that Bryce, as a famed mountaineer, was probably also the first European, by the way, to reach the summit of Mount Ararat. In any case, Bryce, who also published a book depicting his Armenian travels, began carrying the Armenian plea for reforms, autonomy, and even independence from the Ottoman Empire. Bryce also deep, became deeply involved with the Armenian diaspora in Britain. Upon Bryce's marriage on July 23, 1889 to Elizabeth M. Ashton, the Armenian community dedicated a poem in his honor, labeling him as the Lord Byron of Armenia. And here I quote, we cannot at this time forget what thou hast strived to do for years, to free our country from the yokes that change the nation's smile to tears. What Byron was to modern Greece, so to Armenia thou hast been, the friend, the stay, the help in need, a shoulder strong in which to lean. And of course, here you can see, by the way, Byron's uh, Armenian exercise and pottery from the beginning of the century. He was very much involved with Armenian uh, study and so on. This, was, this poem, by the way, was uh, originally written in Armenian and then translated to the Manchester Guardian. Bryce established around him a humanitarian network that held vast social and thematic connections. It mostly included Protestant British, but also German, French, and American nationals, such as Francis Seymour Stevenson, Robert Stein, and the American feminist Alice Blackwell. The network, as will be illustrated now, also involved Armenians living in the diaspora, especially in Britain, Manchester, and London, and France, Paris. This transnational network seemed to retain a certain Christian, pan-Christian pan character. The vocation of the network's members were very diverse, and among its dominant middle class members, there were missionaries, humanitarian activists, Armenian merchants, intellectuals, and statesmen. Now, some of the community members were indeed direct eyewitnesses of Armenian suffering. However, most of its members were not first-hand witnesses and could only be identified as distant sympathizers of the Armenian cause. There was, therefore, a certain geographical and mental gap, I would say, between many of the network's members and the Armenians of Asia Minor. This gap was sometimes bridged through the expression of religious or Christian, I would say, emotionality that allowed the network's members to imagine the distant Armenians as fellow Christians. However, despite some public and political support, Bryce and his network struggled bitterly in promoting their pro-Armenian policy within the British political as well as public sphere. As I will ex ex exemplify now, especially through the actions of Bryce, the fellow Armenians faced criticism, skepticism, and a certain, if you want, governmental ineffectiveness. Alas, despite endless efforts, Bryce could not bridge the gap between what he observed as desired British moral stance towards the fellow Christian Armenians and Britain's real politic, and here it refers to what Israel Cheney spoke about, Professor Cheney spoke about, Britain's real politic limitations in Asia Minor. The abandonment 
of the Armenians by Britain was not necessarily intentional. In many cases, they were merely neglected. Nevertheless, Britain, especially the Israelis' conservative government, did intentionally support the Ottoman Empire. This support was mainly in consequence of the British fear of Russian expansion, of course. Now, following the treaties that settled the Russo-Turkish War, and you can see some of them, uh, San Stefano, Article 16, who refers to the Armenians, the Congress of Berlin, Article 61, who refers to the Armenians and their protection, Bryce and his network tried ardently to improve and even transform the condition of the Armenians. The first immediate necessity was to stop the Kurdish raids against the Armenians, a problem that was addressed in the treaties themselves. During the next stage, Bryce asserted the great powers must promote Armenian self-government. Now here I go into the uh, sources themselves. I have a, a vast majority of uh, correspondence between the figures of the, this fellow Armenian network. Hopefully this will be published as a book one day, uh, uh, but now it's only uh, uh, published in several articles. But here is a vast uh, uh, corpus of, of uh, sources that I think are, are, are staggering and, and really dramatic. In a letter Bryce received on April 17, 1878, from Aznavour, maybe a, a relative of Charles, the late Charles Aznavour, an Armenian activist from Constantinople, the latter promoted a similar idea. I want to read everything, just refer to, the, uh, to, first of all, how he speaks of feelings of humanity professed by Britain, as you can read there, as well as the, the need to have a self-government in Armenia, which is really uh, 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 prominent there. If we spoke, by the way, about German interference within the Armenian question, this started already in the 1890s, especially 1896. For this reason, by the way, you can see, by the way, there a, a map in German, a Verteilung des Armenischen Bevölkerung, which basically depicts all the Armenian uh, demography in the six uh, uh, provinces of Eastern uh, uh, Asia Minor. The subject of Armenia was well Im Im embedded into party politics. Bryce's vigorous support of Armenia was contested by some, especially Tories, who believed that it undermined British interests in Asia Minor. According to some Tories, the Ottomans did not require any reforms. For instance, Robert, Robert Burke, who was the Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs during the signing of the treaties that you just saw in 1878, declared that the port, and I quote, stands out as the champion of civil and religious liberty, end of quote. In the beginning of June 1878, following the first ever debate on Armenia in Parliament, in British Parliament, traveler and diplomat Gifford Palgrave defended Ottoman policy. In one of his letters, written under the signature, A Traveler, Palgrave attacked Bryce's accounts of Armenian suffering as, and I quote, myths which deceived Bryce and his school. End of quote. Palgrave co continued his attack and as a Christian with Jewish roots, his uh, father's name was Francis Palgrev, who was originally Cohen, compared between the condition of the Jews and the Armenians while refuting the demand for Armenian self-government. And this is a marvelous quote here. Were the Jewish dwellers of any European state, of Germany, say, of France, of Russia, of England, to lay before Congress a claim to a separate province, autonomy, and so forth, would anyone be equally ready to back their petition? End of quote. When Gladstone returned to power in 1880, Bryce, as a liberal MP, became the main supporter of the Armenians and was in constant correspondence with various fellow Armenian figures and communities. Due to his pro Armenian actions, he was attacked by the conservative opposition that had accused Bryce of making suggestions about Armenia that harmed British foreign policy and uh, letting, uh, basically he let sleeping dogs, and he should let still it, uh, sleeping dogs to, dogs to lie. In Bryce's correspondence with his fellow Armenian network, one can see how the implementation of Article 61 was crucial to both Bryce and the Armenian representatives. For instance, the Armenian Patriotic Association that was founded in 1888 in London even adopt, adopted Article 61 as the motto of all its formal papers. One of the founders of the association was in frequent contact with us was the Armenian French-based scholar Agopian, Gerbad Agopian. On September 9, 1881, he wrote to Bryce that even under the current liberal government, the reforms in Armenia were not implemented. I won't read everything, but just at the end, even in terms of public response, uh, 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 sorry, 
No, this is not uh, uh, written, but here you can see, of course, Gladstone in Parliament. This, as well as other letters, summarized the general setting of the Armenian question during most of the 1880s. Perhaps there was growing awareness of the poor state of the Armenians, but in practice, no transformation occurred, even in terms of public support or response. It appears that the, the, the Gladstonian liberals also forgot about the Armenians. In 1888-89, the Armenian question became rather more prevalent in British discourse when frequent reports about the Kurdish attacks and unjust arrest of several Armenians reached Britain. As the secretary of the Armenian Patriotic Association wrote to Bryce, and I quote, it is very satisfying to note that the Armenian question is being pro provincially pushed forward. My countrymen are beginning to open their eyes almost everywhere, end of quote. The debates in parliament during 1888 mainly concerned the atrocities inflicted on Armenians by a Kurdish tribal leader by the name of Musa Bey. Some of these incidents, like the kidnapping of an Armenian girl by the name of Gilsar, received great attention and became the symbol of Armenian suffering. Now, before we go forward, Bryce was the key figure in these parliamentary debates, raising motions and providing accounts based on Armenian sources and on evidence that appeared in the British-based journal Armenia about the scale of the Kurdish attacks. According to Bryce, and I quote, the present condition of the country is quite as bad as it has ever been in any time within living memory. And here's something which is uh, Bryce very uh, uh, um, uh, famous for, is the extermination thesis, basically. So based, already in 1888, he speaks about this, and leaves, he lives throughout the whole period from the beginning of the Armenian question, if you want, in the 1870s, up until the genocide. And he is, of course, writing one of the most famous well, reports, which is the Blue Book on the Armenian Genocide. In 1960, it's published in 1916. Of course, it's reporting about 1915. By the way, he writes it with the famous Arnold Toynbee as his uh, uh, advisor. Now here I quote, not only has the Turkish government made no efforts to put down the evils which exist or to check the proceedings of the Kurds, it aggravates the disorders by depriving the Armenian people of weapons. And he, here you can see it there. The whole policy of the Turkish government would make one believe that they were following out the principle laid by, down by Turkish, a Turkish minister some years ago when he said that the way to get rid of the Armenian question was to get rid of the Armenians, end of quote. Bryce, as illustrated, foresaw the possible catastrophic implications of the Turkish policy towards the Armenians. He also warned against the mistaken British policy and advocated for the urgent need to support the Armenian cause. On various occasions, chiefly when the Conservatives were in power, Bryce criticized British foreign policy. He disagreed with the enduring support of the port, uh, the reluctance to cooperate with Russia, and the general apathy toward the misery of the Armenians. However, Bryce himself was sometimes torn between his pro-Armenian stance and his party and state affiliations, especially when he and his own liberal party failed to implement any substantial transformation in Asia Minor. In Asia Minor, sorry. And in 1892, he wrote to the Armenian French scholar Tejares that it is not for England, this is the quote, interest to commit herself permanently to the government's and defense of isolated dependency. Her, I mean Russia, position gives her a more potent voice than England uh, can, uh, can well have in acting upon the Turk to emancipate your fellow countrymen from his devil rule, end of quote. Hence, sometimes Bryce almost vindicated Britain of any wrongdoings and endorsed a certain realpolitik attitude that recognized Britain constraints in Asia Minor. According to him, for instance, Britain operated ardently during the Armenian massacres, which are hardly mentioned today, between 1894 and 1896 or 7, depends, uh, two, two ending dates, for the solution of the Armenian question. Yet the stance of the European powers prevented the implementation of any solution. To conclude, throughout the whole period from 1878 to the beginning of the 1890s, Bryce's Armenian mission was burdened with several problems. In terms of foreign policy, the Armenian question reached a certain deadlock. Neither the liberals nor the conservatives, despite the different attitudes toward the Ottomans and the Armenian questions, were willing or even able to impose reforms. Furthermore, many were still skeptical about Rice's accounts of Armenian misery. 
Bryce tried to raise awareness through motions in Parliament, by writing to newspapers, and by providing practical assistance to the Armenian communities. His efforts were perhaps not in vain, since there was a certain recognition of Ottoman ill rule, but the full severity of the Armenian question was uh, only revealed through another calamity, which came with all its destructive implications during the Hamidian massacres of 1894-97. In 1916, Bryce wrote with a hindsight in his blue book that 1878 had been the year in which a dramatic change to, for the worse had befallen upon the Armenians. He asserted that for 700 years, ever since the Turks conquered Asia Minor, a certain stability had characterized the relations of the ruling Turks with the Armenians. In 1878, once the problem had become an international concern, Abdul Hamid II had identified the Armenians as an internal threat and had adopted an oppressive policy. This is according to Bryce. As shown in this very short lecture, Bryce's report in the Blue Book did not emerge ex nihilo. It was partly founded on his lifelong stance and activity on behalf of Armenia. As he wrote in his Blue Book, and with this I will finish or conclude, with the year 1878, that began a new and sinister epoch in the relations between the Othmani state and the Armenian nation. And of course, thank you very much. Our next speaker via Zoom is uh, Mrs. Naama Ringel, an architect and activist who will talk on the very relevant topic, Artsakh Nagorno-Karabakh, Israel picks a side. So I hope you'll be able to hear. Uh, thank you. So I will talk uh, about the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war that happened uh, in the recent uh, summer and uh, beginning of autumn uh, of 2020, a few months ago. Uh, this conflict is actually a conflict between two friendly states, uh, two friendly countries to the state of Israel. And uh, although these are two friendly countries, uh, Israel seems to have picked a side. Uh, and this is um, very interesting to try to understand why and is it really proper? And why doesn't the Israeli public really know about these kinds of decisions being made by uh, Israeli uh, decision makers? So I will just say uh, a few words undescribed as an activist in the field of uh, arms trade. So I will just say that the first time that I really had um, some encounter with this, uh, with this issue of uh, Israeli arms trade is when I was a student at the Technion. Uh, luckily, I studied architecture, uh, but I had two roommates. One uh, studied computer engineering, the other electrical engineering. And both of them uh, very soon became workers in Rafael and Elbit, um, the security uh, or defense industry. And they developed all kinds of uh, weapon systems. And these were my very adorable uh, roommates as, as a student. Uh, 10 years later, I worked in Angola, the Western African country that was uh, torn by civil war for several decades. And Israeli uh, arms trade companies uh, actually traded with both sides of the conflict. Uh, I arrived in Angola 10 years ago as a regional planner, an urban planner, and uh, what you see here in this um, lower left picture is how an average Angolan city looks like, and it's actually a refugee camp. Um, and this is the consequence of this arms trade that really kept the flames high uh, for a long time. Now, here at the right side of this slide, you can see a group of activists to which I belong. Uh, we're trying to change the arms uh, trade policies in Israel and to bring some more awareness to, to these issues because the public, the general public, really doesn't have a clue about uh, what is going on. So I will start with um, the deep crisis between the US and Israel over an arms deal between China and Israel about 20 years ago. Um, as a result of this crisis, uh, the US put sanctions on Israel and there was some new thinking um, about what should be the, the trade policy. Um, in 2007, 
a general, former general in the Israeli army by the name of Uzi Elan, published a report about the Israeli uh, arms trade, which wasn't um, very regulated until that time, and also showed a brief history of Israeli arms trade. And from this uh, brief history, it is very uh, evident that Israel never really had a very clear red line about who should receive um, the arms that we are exporting around the world. So among the, the customers of Israeli arms, there were countries and regimes that were unaccepted by the international community, some that were involved in drug dealing, others that were involved in genocide. All these were customers of Israel, sometimes even when there was an, another um, uh, other countries would uh, put an embargo on these countries. Now, in the year 2007, the Knesset voted a new law, a new regulation for the supervision on arms exports. It is called in Hebrew, and this law also um, builds a mechanism that should regulate arms trade and also defines what should be the main considerations for the supervision on arms exports. Among these considerations, there are national security issues, foreign relations with Israel, Israel's international obligations, and as well as some vague idea of other vital interests of the state. Now, this is very open-ended. What is uh, other vital interests? Uh, where are the humanitarian considerations? Some would say that they are hidden inside the, the, the general consideration of international obligations. And still, it is not clear what happens when there is contradiction, let's say, between national security interests and perhaps other humanitarian interests, which interest should be the, the more important interest to consider. Um, recently, and perhaps um, already for many, many years, Israel has been a big player in the global uh, arms trade market. Uh, we can see here very recent data from March 2021. Uh, this is uh, produced by CIPRI. CIPRI is one of the think tanks uh, about arms trade and it's uh, located in Stockholm. And they uh, claim that Israel is the eighth biggest trader of arms in the world. Uh, of course, it is much behind United States and Russia, which are on the top of this chart. But still, Israel is a very big arms uh, trader. And the main recipients of the Israeli arms are number one, India, number two, Azerbaijan, and number three, Vietnam. Now, in this conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, we will, of course, be interested to focus on these uh, trade, arms trade uh, relations between Israel and Azerbaijan. So, of course, in Azerbaijan, there could be some very nice people, but when Israel trades in arms, it trades with the regime. And the current regime in Azerbaijan is a totalitarian regime. It's led by the president of Azerbaijan named Ilham Aliyev. He inherited um, the, the reign from his father, who was the president before him. And Ilham Aliyev, he... Uh, was honored with the title of 2012 Person of the Year in Organized Crime and Corruption, which is, of course, um, a very uh, special and important title I'm sure he is proud of. Uh, so this is the man. Uh, he's almost uh, taken over the entire parliament of Azerbaijan. He has taken a lot of assets of Azerbaijan. He controls the economy. Uh, he is a very strong person and, as you can see, um, not considered to be a very decent person. Here is a visit that Mr. Netanyahu paid to Azerbaijani president in Baku a few years ago, four and a half years ago, to be accurate. And uh, in this um, visit, they held a, a press conference and President Aliyev described the close cooperation between his country and Israel in very uh, different um, fields of cooperation, among them uh, cooperation in defense, um, you know, sharing defense equipment, trading uh, between defense companies. And he said that the volume of trade is $5 billion. $5 billion, maybe more precisely, as he says here, $4,850,000,000. 
So this is not uh, a small, um, small trade partner. Now, what is defense equipment? It sounds very neutral when we say $5 billion for defense equipment. Maybe it's even peaceful. Uh, we're protecting lives. But this defense equipment is actually a very offensive equipment, as we have learned from this incident that happened just a few months later in 2017, when Israeli drone makers were asked to demonstrate their UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, and to show how it crashes into um, an Armenian base with, uh, it's actually a live target, it was um, manned, there were people inside this base, and this is what the technicians of aeronautics were asked to do. Somehow this incident um, was, was known in other Israeli, um, by other Israeli manufacturers of arms and there was a complaint that was filed on this incident and the Ministry of Defense had to actually inquire into what really happened there. Um, consequently, this uh, company Aeronautics wasn't traded in the stock, uh, stock exchange market and was bought by uh, Rafael. So today it is not an independent manufacturer anymore, it is part of Rafael. Uh, but this is very rare that incidents as such are uh, being known and that there are such complaints uh, being filed. Usually these kind of incidents are just happening and nobody has to, um, to take uh, account or, or be responsible for it. Um, I don't know why. Oh, okay. So I was stuck for a second, I'm sorry. Um, at the same time, the years 2016 and 17, when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu visited uh, Baku, and at the time of the aeronautics incident, some politicians in Israel, they called to stop arms trade with Azerbaijan. They said, the weapons that we sell to Azerbaijan, they are going to be um, then uh, brought against Armenia, they're going to be used against Armenia, and this is not what Israel would like to do because Armenia is not an enemy state. It didn't get enough attention. They were, they were voiced, but nobody really uh, heard them. Several years later, the relations, the diplomatic relations between Armenia and Israel did become stronger. Armenia opened an embassy in Tel Aviv officially late September, um, really uh, just before Rosh Hashanah. It was uh, intentional, it was to start the Jewish New Year with this uh, new Armenian embassy, and it was very festive. Unfortunately, less than a week later, an Azerbaijani cargo airplane landed in the Uvda airport in the southern part of Israel. Now, the Uvda airport is the only airport in the country from which explosives can be flown, and this is perhaps the reason why these uh, airplanes landed in Uvda. Now, there was a series of four flights, just, uh, it's very unusual that four cargo flights arrived in Uvda airport, and uh, it was very easy to, to track these flights because at the same time, due to COVID-19 restrictions, there were hardly any flights happening otherwise. So these four flights were noticed. And later on, when in the 27th of September, the, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh broke out, it was pretty clear what these planes were doing in Israel. They were actually coming to pick some ammunition for this uh, new conflict that just erupted. Uh, this airlift from Israel to Azerbaijan was published both in Israel media and international media, and everyone explained the, this for a uh, flight series as a part of uh, the support that Israel gives Azerbaijan with new munition and uh, some more weapons. At the same time, the 30th of September, it's all now you know, in, in spans of days. Uh, the 30th of September, there were reports about Syrian mercenaries that are being mobilized to Nagorno-Karabakh. Still, nothing happened. Nobody halted Israeli arms trade with Azerbaijan. Although now it has been known that among the troops of Azerbaijan, there are also some Syrian warriors that are jihadists. Um, of course, the new ambassador, from Armenia couldn't really just ignore what was going on and he was recalled to Armenia. Now it's not that 
the fact that Israel sells arms to Azerbaijan was not known because this has been going on for many, many years before. But um, the, the ambassador, he was very angry that this trade was going on as warfare started in nagorno karabakh The fact that it didn't stop at the point when it was clear that this weapon is going to target Armenians and it's going to target Armenians in nagorno karabakh still these, um, this trade went on. Now, sadly, as in any war, there were some war crimes committed in this uh, nagorno karabakh war. Um, Two, seven days into the war, there have been some civilian targets attacked. Uh, we can see here the description of an attack on uh, Stepanakert, the capital city of Nagorno-Karabakh, that in the 4th of October, uh, some civilians were killed there, and um, Amnesty uh, suspects that they were killed by Israeli um, missiles. They say here, likely parts of an extra ballistic missile, which is an Israeli weapon, known to have been sold to Azerbaijan. Um, probably some other Israeli weapons were used in this war as cluster munitions that were sold back uh, years ago. Today it is forbidden to sell these kind of weapons, but it, it was sold before and it was used now. Um, other war crimes also happened and all, all of these uh, information did not bring any of the decision makers in Israel to decide that they stop arms trade with Azerbaijan during the conflict. Now, a different example is Canada that decided to suspend all export permits to Turkey because it did find out that Turkey is taking some of this Canadian technology and using it in the conflict in nagorno karabakh during the war. So Turkey, so uh, sorry, Canada, on 5th of October, which is about a week into the war in nagorno karabakh decided to suspend all arms permits to Turkey. Um, Israel didn't do anything alike. Israel didn't announce uh, that it stops, and it probably didn't really stop uh, exporting arms. During the war, there were a lot of voices calling to suspend Israeli arms trade with Azerbaijan. There were intellectuals and rabbis and public figures that tried to bring a new decision, that tried to, to make Israel consider once again its arms trade with Azerbaijan. But again, all these voices didn't receive any attention. In the beginning of November, again, another second airlift from Israel to Azerbaijan, from the Uvda airport, where you can fly explosives um, to the north of Azerbaijan, where there is uh, perhaps a military base, um, as it's an assumption, of course, we cannot uh, really know where, where the plane landed. But uh, it is pretty obvious it's the same pattern as in the first airlift, the same route. So it's hard to actually doubt the fact that this is probably a second uh, airlift of, of munition going to Azerbaijan directly uh, in, its, in its war with, Nagorno with uh, Armenia and nagorno karabakh what happened is, um, you know, Azerbaijan could have uh, continued with the war until it took over the entire territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. But then, at the 9th of October, uh, sorry, the 9th of November, there was an accident that Azerbaijani forces somehow in a different place, closer to the Nakhichevan border in the western of Armenia, not close to Nagorno-Karabakh, they gunned down a Russian helicopter. And that was above Armenian land, not in Nagorno-Karabakh, not in a war zone. Now, this incident perhaps was the reason why Azerbaijan was actually obliged to take the offer of the Russians to have a ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's not from their free will, and it's not from their pacifistic um, uh, view of how things should be. They probably, they had the ammunition, they just had the second airlift uh, from Israel to Azerbaijan, and they could have just continued and conquered the entire territory. But they stopped, they did take a lot of the territory under their control, but still there, some, there is some territory remaining under Armenian control. So the whole situation is unstable. The Azerbaijanis, they didn't really reach the, the full potential of what they hoped for. 
And now they are just uh, being peaceful as long as the Russians are, are still around. Uh, in the aftermath of the war, there are some um, researchers that try to make an assessment what was the Israeli contribution to the war. Uh, first of all, this war is considered to be the war of the future. Um, hardly any war has ever been conducted in this way. Um, this is a super technological war, different uh, types of, of weapons that were never used before and different technologies used for gathering uh, intelligence. And it seems that Israel was very, um, has, has, has had a very uh, big contribution both in um, the weapons, the drones, and in intelligence gathering, as you can see from these publications here. Now, all this is um, very, um, very unfortunate because we're talking about a friendly country that Israel has actually uh, helped to fight and actually um, somehow made it lose, lose its war. But then the question is how all this is relevant to the genocide? And there is some relevance to the genocide as well, because here uh, we can already uh, get the impression when we look at uh, President Aliyev uh, traveling with his wife along the, the, the very beautiful landscapes of Nagorno-Karabakh, and he's stepping on a sign bearing the name of an Armenian settlement that was there and was conquered and is now under Azerbaijani control. He is actually expressing his disrespect to the Armenians. And this disrespect is also heard in his speeches uh, because he's using a lot of terms of hate speech. I should just uh, um, read some, some phrases here, for example, from this description of his um, visit to Nagorno-Karabakh, and he's here meeting with some Azerbaijan soldiers that are still located there. And he says, Khanlik settlement was given an ugly Armenian name. And then the soldiers answer him, your words are our motto. We chase them down like dogs. So you can really hear this uh, hate speech, you know, from not between the lines, but it is very evident, very apparent. It's just out there. And then again, the denial of the Armenian history in the region. Uh, here, here is another um, part, a paragraph from another speech of Ilham Aliyev from December uh, 2020. That's a speech to the nation. And he says about the Armenians, uh, they destroyed our historical sites, created a false history, and published maps. This completely con contradicts the traditions, rules, and rules of conduct in this region. This shows, again, that the Armenian people had nothing in common with our region. They have never been indigenous people of the Caucasus. They are aliens, meaning they don't even see that the Armenians have any right on the land. They don't belong there. They, they shouldn't be there. They are aliens in the region. Okay, so uh, this can't be mistaken because this is what Aliyev tells the entire Azerbaijani nation. Okay, he is really trying to, um, to bring up these feelings of hatred among Azerbaijani people. Now, there is also the cultural dimension, the cultural genocide, and we can see here the Julfa Cemetery. Now, this is in Akhichivan, which is the western enclave of Azerbaijan. But when we see what happened there with this very unique cemetery, which was uh, a monument of, of heritage, of cultural heritage, and perhaps could have been considered as world heritage because of its very exquisite uh, artistic um, capabilities that it manifests here, uh, so then this very unique uh, monument was completely destroyed under the Azerbaijani rule. And here we see how it looked like in the beginning of the millennium. And just a few years later, even all these broken stones were just removed from the site. And today it's just a bare land site. There's no remain from this very uh, special monument that was there. And this, the, the full destruction, the completion of the destruction was done under the regime of Ilham Aliyev, the current president. Now, in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, there is some um, effort to try and preserve the cultural heritage. So here we see that there is a, an expert expedition trying to organize, but then 
uh, UNESCO does not get any authorization that it can actually send the send a delegation to Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan doesn't respond, and therefore nobody really knows what is now the current situation with the Armenian monuments, with the religious sites. Um, perhaps they have been damaged in war. Perhaps they are being damaged right now by Azerbaijanis, as we had seen the Julfa Cemetery in Khichevan. So we see that um, cultural remains of the Armenian religion, of the Armenian heritage, are being destroyed in Akhichevan and perhaps now in Nagorno-Karabakh. And they are also being destroyed in Turkey. In the very uh, few uh, months after the war, we already have seen some destruction of uh, ancient Armenian sites in Turkey. For example, this ancient Armenian church in Kutaya. Uh, now, Kutaya, that was a, a significant uh, community of Armenians. We can just mention um, Komitas, which is, of course, um, a, a very known musician of um, eth ethnic music of the Armenians, considered to be a great litur liturgist of the Armenians. And uh, uh, he was one of, actually, uh, the intellectuals taken at the 24th of April, 1915, um, as, as the, the very first event uh, of, of the genocide. And then another uh, member of this very special community in Kutaya is David Ohanesyan, which as a refugee arrived in Jerusalem and became the most important artist of Armenian ceramics here in Jerusalem. So they originate from Kutaya, and here is this ancient Armenian church in Kutaya in Turkey that was just destroyed the end of January, three months ago. So Armenian heritage is being destroyed all over this region now. So when will this come to an end? It seems that the trade is just fine, it just goes on. Here we can see an uh, Azerbaijani Armed Forces announcement that was published in uh, February, just two months ago, uh, in uh, the Telegram. And it says, here I had, uh, I translated with the Google Translate, it says that Azerbaijan is going to buy weapons from Israel in the worth of $2 billion, and the contracts are going to be signed in the summer. So it is just going to continue as it was until now. No doubts, no other new thoughts, because uh, who are these weapons going to be intended for? And nobody considers what about, you know, all these uh, civilians that were hurt by the weapons, that were targeted directly by Azerbaijan. So there's probably no second thought and Israel just goes on. And to also give the other example of what Israel could have done as Canada did stop the trade during the war, Canada now decided to cancel entirely all the export permits to Turkey. And this is already several months after the war because it sees that when it exports to Turkey, the weapons find their way to Nagorno-Karabakh and this is not where they were intended. So we could have been uh, just like Canada during the war, stopping the arms trade with Azerbaijan and we could have been just like Canada right now. This, this announcement is from two weeks ago and decide that since these are the things that happened during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, we are not going to keep selling arms to Azerbaijan. So this is what, that's my take on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Naama, for this very important uh, talk. We will now have our second musical interlude before we uh, complete this uh, evening. This time with uh, Ilya Mazia on the Armenian Duduk and Noam Dayan on the Kam uh, Kamanche. They'll perform three songs, Dle Aman, an Armenian lamentation song, Sayat Nova Kani Vurjam Im, As Long As I Live, and Komitas Shushiki, an Armenian dance melody. Thank you. Uh, good evening. The first song we are going to play is called The Le Aman. It's uh, an Armenian folk song and uh, lamentation about two lovers uh, with evil fate. And it was uh, it was collected and adapted to the voice and the piano by a uh, famous Armenian composer and ethnomusicologist. Uh, Komitas Vardapet, 
and we are taking it back to the instrumental folk, folk arrangement.
It's called Carnival Journey. Uh, it's a video, uh, uh, Armenia Love Song, uh, written by uh, Armenia Troubadour, whose name was Sayat Nova. Thank you. 
thank you. And the last melody is also a, 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 I will say composed by the Comitas for the Pet. Uh, Comitas is a very often play, played at uh, such events because he was uh, the witness and uh, one of the martyrs of the Stalinian uh, genocide. Uh, some, um, uh, he was a very interesting person. He uh, spent a lot of time uh, moving uh, between the villages and, and collecting the uh, folk music. And thanks to him, the, the, many of these melodies are known today because with one million and a half uh, people who died, uh, everybody actually... Also, the, the melodies are lost in the end. Um, he kept for us thousands of melodies. Some of these melodies he uh, adapted to the classic music, and um, the next one is uh, usually played by virtuoso pianists. This is one of uh, the seven Armenian dances, a very uh, well-known uh, collection of piano music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ilya and uh, Noah, for this uh, lovely uh, music. As our evening is drawing to a close, let me invite Advocate Kevork uh, Nalbandian, lay judge at the Regional Labor Court of Jerusalem, known well to many of, of you as an activist in the Armenian community and working to strengthen Jewish-Armenian relations. You will give us some concluding remarks. Good evening, everybody. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. President Joe Biden declared on April 24th, 2021, the Armenian people honor all those Armenians who perished in the genocide that began 106 years ago. <clears throat> Last Friday, we marched through the streets of Jerusalem, holding big signs on which was written, we march for justice. What is justice that we are looking for? No one can bring back our ancestors that were brutally killed that were slaughtered, butchered, hung, shot, tortured. No one can bring back the loving hugs of our loved ones. Our houses, villages, streets, farms, homes, all have been geographically and topography changed. So many of those disappeared without a trace. So if you cannot bring all of this back, what is it we are looking for? Is it revenge? Do we want to execute someone? And if so, who? The Young Turks? All the Turks, all the nation of the Turks, under what allegation? Will this really bring justice? I would like to propose a different form of justice. Armenians' war with Azerbaijan de deepened the hatred towards Turkey. As Christians, we are commanded to forgive. It is our cross to bear, as written in Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. As I look at us as Armenians, we see we are bowing down to the purpose of the Turks' genocide. We need to love one another. We must love, as Armenians, one another. This will bring true justice. Recognition brings healing. It can also bring forgiveness, as Jesus did for us. A few years ago, I met three Turks in Turkey. They came closer to me and gave me a hug. They asked me for forgiveness for what their ancestors had done to my ancestors. 
They were willing to ask for forgiveness because they recognized the atrocities of their ancestors and took responsibility for them. It was a touching moment. I was shocked. I froze for a moment. Then they said, we love you as an Armenian. We have done terrible things to your nation, but now, through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we do not, we do not have to be enemies, but can be brothers. Jesus has forgiven us, us and melted the hatred. What more could I ask for as an Armenian? This is the true justice. Thank you all. Many thanks, Gevold, for these moving uh, words. Let me just finish by thanking the Jack and Joseph Morton Mandel School for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, its director, Professor Danny Schwartz, and the administrative team led by Irina Dostov. My colleagues from the university, especially the indefatigable Professor Ruven Amitai, Professor Donna Shalev, Professor Michael Stone, Dr. Odej Steinberg, Mr. Yoav Lov for all their hard work. Mr. Tolag Mumjian for good advice and further support. The Jerusalem Center for Genocide Prevention and its director, Professor Eli Richter. Mr. Harut Baramian for all kind assistance, all the speakers, musicians and singers, and finally, all of you joined us this evening. Shnoa Galutyun, Barigishel.